Now as we're going online, I, greet, I bring you greetings as I welcome you all here to Bethel United Church of Christ in Evansville, Indiana. I'm Reverend Samuel Buer, and I'm pleased to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here in this place, here in this place where we strive to serve all people. Uh, we welcome you who are gathered with us this morning in person and also those that are joining us online as we're all one faith community uh, this day as we gather. Uh, if you're new to us, throughout every month we do a, one focus of, our, of a mission offering, and throughout the month, month of March, uh, our offering will be associated with the One Great Hour of Sharing, which is a, a, a wider mission of the United Church of Christ and several other denominations as we strive to address uh, some issues, of, uh, mission uh, issues uh, literally around the world. And so these could be hunger issues or others or, or water issues, just depends on, on what the crises that, that arise. So I invite you to be generous with the One Great Hour of Sharing. Also, uh, we've been raising funds for a Habitat home. Uh, we've been challenged by one of our members to raise $80,000 to build a home uh, here in Evansville uh, in honor of one of, our for one of our members that died last year, Larry Atman. Larry was real strong in veterans organizations and so we're, uh, it'll be a home that's gonna be dedicated for a veteran to live in. Uh, again, our goal was $80,000 and if you look back at the hammer, I saw the, the mark went up sometime this last week. Uh, we're now about $12,000 or so yet needed towards that goal of $80,000. And so really appreciate all that have been making uh, contributions to that. So many, many thanks. Um, let us now worship God this day. I invite you to turn to the call to worship. I lift my eyes to the hills, to the mountains. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We look not to the mountains or the valleys, even heaven or earth, for God is found among us. Wherever two or three are gathered in Christ's name, God is here among us. Come, let us worship the God of creation, the God of people, the God of community. I'd invite those who are able to stand as we sing, Lift My Eyes. join me in the prayer of discipleship. Generous God, you gave us our voices, no two the same. As you did with Abraham and Sarah, you take and touch our lives and make and became extraordinary. And in your church, you have gathered us in your community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people. You have called us and made us a place for us. So let what we say and do here, what we ponder and decide here, be real for us and honest to you as you prepare us for the life of the world in which you are praised. Amen.
out there on the little um, table uh, where you can sign up to uh, help with the Easter egg hunt in any way, whether it's setting up or cleaning up or during the hunt. Um, and then we also have candy on this side. There's, if you notice, there's candy uh, collection bins on both sides. This side is for the children's child, uh, children, uh, child care, sorry. And uh, this side is for the Easter egg hunt. So if you are able to bring any candy, that would be a big help. <coughs> we appreciate it. We are planning to fill 2,000 eggs, so it does take a lot of candy. Um, also, we have youth group now on Sundays after church. So um, anyone who would like to come to that, we will gather in the youth room after the service. In our New Testament reading today, we learn about a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus late one night because he was hungry. No, he wasn't looking for a late night snack. He was hungry for spiritual food. 
He was hungry for the truth about the kingdom of God. He came to Jesus because he had questions and he knew that Jesus would have the answers. Nicodemus reminds us, or reminds me, of the very hungry caterpillar. You may, have, you may be familiar with that book. Eric Carl wrote it. And we have a little two minute video for you to see of the author himself reading the book. The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carl. For my sister Krista, in the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and popped out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. He started to look for some food. On Monday, he ate through one apple, but he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate through two pears, but he was still hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums, but he was still hungry. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries, but he was still hungry. On Friday, he ate through five oranges, but he was still hungry. On Saturday, he ate through one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of cherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. That night, he had a stomach ache. <laughs> the next day was Sunday again. The caterpillar ate through one nice green leaf, and after that, he felt much better. Now he wasn't hungry anymore, and he wasn't a little caterpillar anymore. He was a big, fat caterpillar. He built a small house, called a cocoon around himself. He stayed inside for more than two weeks. Then he nibbled a hole in the cocoon, pushed his way out, and he was a beautiful butterfly. Isn't that a wonderful story? The very hungry caterpillar reminds me of what Jesus said to Nicodemus. I think that the very hungry caterpillar could help Nicodemus understand what Jesus said. He said to Jesus, teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. No one could perform the miracles that you have performed if God were not with him. And then Jesus said something so amazing and confusing for Nicodemus. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can a man be born again? Jesus went on to explain to Nicodemus that a person is born again when the spirit of God enters into his heart. And that's what it means to be born again. Jesus explained further in John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So let's think about the story of the very hungry caterpillar. When he came out of his cocoon, he was a totally new creation, a butterfly. That's the way it is when we're born again and we let Jesus come into our hearts. He makes us a new creation. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God we praise you that in Jesus we are a new creation. We praise you that in Jesus we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. The old is gone and the new has come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, I would like to invite any kids and teenagers here to join us in the chapel. Our first reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4a. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land 
that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Our second reading today is from the book of John, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about early things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And Moses, as lifted up, as, as lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bruce. Let's bow our heads for a moment for prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the sermon this day, I had originally planned to, to work off that first text. And I titled the sermon, You Are Blessed. But then as I worked more and more on the sermon, I thought I gave it the wrong title. I want to speak to a text that's very familiar to most of us, John 3, 16. Many of us, I know I had to memorize it as a confirmation class back in when I was a probably 12 years old or so, so it's in that memory bank someplace. I also encounter it every day when I drive into church because I live out on the west side and as I come in on 62, somebody has chosen to mow it into the hillside, or at least the verse numbers, uh, as to remind me of my faith and where I'm going, heaven or hell, I think. But I struggle with what they've done because at the top of that hill, they've also placed an American flag on a flagpole. But if you're serious about the text, it talks about the world. It doesn't talk, never reads in there about the United States of America. This is for the world. So I'm not sure what 
whoever's doing the mowing and has placed that there, what their real intent is, makes me wonder. This text also takes me back to my youth. So I'm gonna show my age here as I was growing up in the 70s and so I remember I'd be watching uh, uh, sports programs. Anybody have an idea where I'm going with John 3.16 and sports programs in the 70s and the 80s? Whether it be a basketball game, the person would be behind the goalpost or behind the, the, the basket someplace with a wig on, a rainbow wig, and a sign, John 3.16. Or they'd show up at football games and find some way to get in front of the TV screen, in front of the, the cameras. You name the sport, that fellow was there. John 3.16. Now, my, I would say I'm a skeptic, but I'm also kind of, huh? And I think, don't belittle my faith in some ways. And I, I wasn't always so sure about what that guy was doing. But also part of my tradition in my history was I grew up in Northwest Ohio. And in that part of Ohio, every summer, there was a, a revival, a crusade. And in that part of Ohio, it was the Blue, Bill Glass Crusade. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? I don't know if they did. They do that down here in Evansville area? Uh, he played, he was an NFL player in his, in his time, and he played for the Detroit Lions, and also uh, there's a team up in Cleveland. He caught that. <laughs> well, and so, 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 so those of us in Northwest Ohio, this guy was a famous man for all of us. Did I enjoy going to the crusades? No. But my mom and dad would drag us along because they would sing in the choirs. And so we'd have to go night after night. And always at the end of the crusades, and under the evening, there's that altar call. And I gotta admit, one night it struck me, and I, I watched all these people around me getting up you know, and going down in front of the stage. And I thought, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. And so I went down and I stood with, and there were probably a couple hundred of us, maybe 200 of us down in front of the stage that night. And then when that part of the prayer was over, then we were all ushered back in underneath the, the, um, the, the seating area. And at that point, I felt schnookered, my word. Because over half the people that were standing with me down there were volunteers for the Bill Glass Crusade. <laughs> I was schnookered. But I was intent, so I went through it. Now again, you got a little bit of my sense of humor and my skepticism going on here. I was sharing in the Sunday school class this morning. I studied before ministry, I was in the sciences. And I learned in the biological sciences, my undergraduate degree, I learned to ask the questions, to be very careful how you format your question that you're asking for in the lab because the question oftentimes determines the outcome, depending on how you pose the question. So you always have to be careful how you set things up. Let me give you a clue, and this is true also in life. I was doing counseling some years ago with a young couple in our church that had gotten married, and this was now a year later, and they're struggling. They're having a daily fight, and I had given them, given them some resources during that pre-marriage, pre-marital time on how to deal with conflicts, and they just weren't able to work this one out. Well, the conflict essentially was, she had to get up a little bit earlier than he did to go to work because of her work schedule and his was more laid back and so he'd lay in bed and never get up with her. And she didn't like that. She wanted him to get up and eat with her and, and things in the morning. And so she found all kinds of ways to solve this problem. Some were kicking him in the bed. 
Others were slamming doors, making it sm- and talking really loud, doing all kinds of things, and not a single one of them was solving the problem because he was, he was probably just putting the pillow over his head more so <laughs> and not getting up. So we, we laid out the problem, and I sent him home to come back with, you know, work on it a bit, and then come back and tell me how, how, how you're doing. And when they came back, they said, we decided that she's going to get a different job. <laughs> I, where did that come from? And they said, we'd asked the wrong question. The problem, we had posed the question wrong. The problem was not him not getting up in the morning. The problem really was she hated her job. And she wanted some comfort in the morning. She wanted to have a good moment before she went off to a place that she hated. They had set the problem up incorrectly and they were never gonna get to where they needed to go until they posed the right question and reformulated it. I'm gonna argue that that's true of this text as well. In some sense of the word, we've all been schnookered when it comes to John 3.16. We've set it up a certain way and said this is how it is, and then it leads us to a certain place, and for many of us, it's, it's like in a crusade, either you're gonna be saved or you're gonna to go to hell. And that's the question that's really being posed in that time. But you gotta read the next verse. You don't stop at 16, you gotta read the 17th verse. And in the 17th verse, it says Jesus came to save the whole world. There's no condemnation in this verse at all. Hell is never mentioned. It's not mentioned in the Gospel of John. But this text has been set in a certain place for centuries for us. And it's led us to a different place. So let me do a little journey with you. So we might reclaim this verse, if you will. So we turn to the text, for God so loved the world, God gave their only son, so that whoever believes in in the son and him may not perish, but have eternal life. So again, the assumption that I had all those many years was, if I don't believe in him, I'm going to hell. That's what I was taught in a number of places. That's a number of churches teach that. But it's just not there. Again, verse 17. Indeed, God did not send the, world in, to send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It was never intended for judgment, but that the whole world, the whole cosmos would be saved. I got started on this journey, a wonderful prisoner of mine in one, in one of our churches, when someone would ask him the question, are you saved? Do you ever get that question asked? Are you saved? His answer was, I was saved 2,000 years ago by what Jesus did. You bet I'm saved. But just not in the way that you're asking the question. I'm saved in a much greater way. Another thing I've learned about this text in the Gospel of John, and the English translation does not do it justice. For God so loved the world, God gave their only Son, that everyone who believes in him, and the word is not belief. That's how we've translated it. We've made made it into a head thing. The word is better translated trust. For God so loved the world that God gave their only son that whoever trusts in Jesus, trusts in his way, trusts in his teachings. And trust is more of a body thing. It's more of a heart thing. It's more of a way of living. 
So it's no longer, as long as I, you know, the old way was, as long as I said these right words and I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, then I'm saved. No, that's not, that's not what the gospel is saying. The gospel is saying is, put your trust in what Jesus taught. In the way that he lived, in the way that he welcomed the outcasts and the other. So be much better read. For God so loved the world, God gave God's only Son, that everyone who trusts in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Now here's the next problem. It's the, word, it's the words eternal life. It's a bad translation. And our scholars know it, that that's a bad translation. But this is verse has become such a, a heartfelt verse for so many of us that in the recent scriptures where they've tried to make some changes, they realize we can't because we the people are holding them back. The better translation, instead of eternal life, is fullness of life. John, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, what's quoted here, Jesus was not talking about something off in heaven and after we're dead. He was talking about life now. Fullness of life. But again, the most recent versions that have come, the more recent versions of scriptures that have come out, the scholars know we can't change that word, that wording, without a huge outcry from many people of faith who will say, don't change my gospel. Or in other words, don't correct what's wrong. Because my faith can't take it. (laughs) So better read it. For God so loved the world, God gave God's only Son, that everyone who trusts in him may not perish, but may live life to its fullest. Now that's a scripture I can hang my hat on and my life on. You've heard me talk about Bishop Irenaeus, if you've been here for any length of time, way back a bishop of the early church, who said the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. And when you're fully alive, you're not perishing. And that's what Jesus was about getting us all to a point where we're fully alive. Now, you've heard my frustrations. I've been praying for, in our, in our prayer team that met on Thursday, one of on the team said they have a friend who is a member of, a, of the United Methodist Church, and it's one of the churches out on the west side someplace, I think she might have named it, who said in two weeks they're going to take a vote. Not only have you been following the United Methodist Church in any recent times, in the last year or two, but if you're taking a vote in the Methodist Church right now, it means you're voting out, away from a church that's welcoming of gay and lesbian people. So this woman that we were praying for her in her church, she's heartbroken, heartsick over where her church might choose to do and might choose to vote out. And what I want to say is there's many people that have misread scripture, just like this scripture has been misread. I learned early back in the 80s when I was in seminary, there's not a single word in scripture that has to do with gay and lesbian people. But what we've done is we've read into the scripture a bunch of negativity, a bunch of biases, and then we've laid it over top of others. Here's my attempt today to reclaim some of our texts, some of our most valuable texts. Jesus never spoke about gay and lesbian people. He spoke about all people. 
living fullness of life. Choose life this day that we may not perish. One other quick word before I leave this. The word that we've translated world is also kind of incorrect. It's broader than that. The Greek word is cosmos. Translated in English, the cosmos. Everything from Florida, fauna, you name it, is all a part God's fullness is wish for all of us in this time. So some thoughts on John 3.16. Maybe when I drive up 62 and I see that in the, in the yard, I might think different this next time about it. Maybe my transforming thoughts might eke into the guy that's doing the mowing a little bit too. Who knows? Amen. I would invite those who are able to rise as we sing Blessed Assurance. You'll find it on pages 9 and 10 in our bulletins. I invite you to be seated as we prepare ourselves for a time of prayer. As again, as we pray this prayer that's printed before us, let's keep in mind those who we named earlier in the service, those who need God's healing touch, as well as those who are grieving. Oh God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You invite us to extend that love to the world around us and to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. And so we bring the needs of our world before you now.
for the many who do not have enough, enough for food to eat or shelter to keep warm, enough employment or money to pay their bills, enough medicine or medical care. pray for those who have more than enough, but who still struggle to find meaning and purpose in life, who indulge in dangerous or self-serving activities to dull their pain or loneliness. reaches out to all of us, and you call us to live as citizens of heaven, working together with one heart and mind. Strengthen us to live in a manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives in service of your kingdom, where the last are first and the first are last, and there is grace enough for everyone. now in the prayer that Jesus has taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lies the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now dedicate the gifts of our time and our talents and our treasures. Please pray with me. What can we give to you, O holy God? All that we have and all that we are already belong to you. And we have it on trust, knowing that one day we will leave this world and take nothing with us. And so we pray for what will give us real life, make us rich in faith, wealthy in wisdom, and generous with everything you blessed us with in this life, that we may truly be called disciples of Jesus the Christ. Amen. <laughs> We now come to this table. As I make preparations for this table, I want to remind you. Or inform some of you. This is an open table. Everyone is welcome here. If you're questioning your faith, you're welcome at this table. If you're not sure you have a faith at all, you're welcome at this table. Jesus excluded no one. He wanted everybody to experience fullness of life. Whether you're a babe in arms or 101, you're welcome at this table. Thanks be to God. So hear these words. He was always the guest in the homes of Martha and Mary, tax collectors and Pharisees, at the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the case for the poor, upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger. He was always the guest. But here at this table, he is the host. So those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to follow him must first be fed by him. For this is a table where God intends for us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can transform us in the brilliance of new life. So come, you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, 
for a better life, for a fairer world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. The Lord is here. God's Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. So we give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator of all that is. At your word, the earth has, was made and spun on its course among the planets. Your hands burst forth light, carved out rivers, and shaped the mountains. Created by you to live in your peace of hope and joy, we wandered in the valleys which shielded your radiant splendor from our eyes. And when we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us, and your love remained steadfast. When we were slaves in Egypt, you broke the bonds of our oppression, brought us through the seed of freedom, and made covenant to be our God. You led us through the desert to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. We join our voices with the faithful in every time and place to praise with you with joy. So we give thanks for Jesus our Lord. He descended the mountain of glory to climb up a garbage heap called Calvary. He could have stayed with Moses and Elijah, but chose to be crucified between two thieves. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. He could have taken shelter within your love and hope, but endured the cross of pain and suffering. He died that we might live and is risen to raise us to new life. One humble himself is raised to rule over all creation. Merciful God, as sisters and brothers in faith, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus Christ. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. And Jesus took a cup and after giving thanks, gave it to the disciples and said, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So descend upon us, Holy Spirit, upon these gifts of bread and cup. As we share them with one another, may we be restored to wholeness. Strengthened by the broken bread, may we, we act for justice. Nourished by your cup of grace, may we feed the hungry. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to the body of Christ in the world. May this table be your joy and song joined together, brothers and sisters from every time and every place, forever dancing with holy you, God and community, holy is one. Amen. So we re-break the bread, the body of our Lord, that we might be fed and nourished. And we pour the cup, a cup of blessing, a cup of new life. Amen. Come for all things are ready. As you receive the bread, I invite you to take it and to hold it until we all can take it together. Also in each tray is a little uh, uh, cup with some gluten-free bread in it as well. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child Sometimes I feel like a motherless child Sometimes I feel like a A long ways from home, a long ways from home. 
In this moment, you're not a motherless child. You are at the table being fed by the great mother of all. Take and eat. As you receive the, <clears throat> the juice and the wine, the wine is what is the whiter substance and the grape juice the darker. That feeling that Rob so beautifully sung of. If that's where you are, a long way from home, may the distance be cut short in this moment, for we're home for this time. Take and drink. Please join with me in this prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, in this place, at this table, we have touched, we have tasted, we have heard the signs of your love for us. Grant that we may go away from this house filled with love for you and overflowing with your love for those who are around us. Send us forth from this place in love that your justice may be worked out with gentleness and power known in the presence of your spirit. Amen. I'd invite those who are able to rise now as we sing of this great love, love divine.
us now turn to the benediction. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, so God sends us into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be light for the world. And now, as I say with every service, this service has ended, but your service now begins. Go, knowing that the Spirit of Christ is upon you, and be gracious. Amen.